to uh, design uh, handmade kernels. Uh, and there's, however, also, uh, and I wanted to mention that, uh, and that's now my last uh, postscriptum regarding kernels, uh, there's also the opposite effort, namely to omit the kernel trick and really map uh, to this high dimensional space explicitly. Now, after all that I've, you know, I've been preaching for two weeks that uh, the kernel trick is fantastic, and now I tell you that there is a way to not use it. Uh, you know, why, why would you do that? Uh, the reason is that uh, the, if, you, if you want to make a decision for a new incoming sample, uh, you, well, you, uh, you have a new sample X, and to find out whether you want to classify it as class one or class two, you uh, multiply it with your weight vector W, and the weight vector W itself in SVMs given like that. And if we don't use a kernel uh, for now. And if you have a, <coughs> a large number of support vectors, uh, this expression can become long, okay? So, so you, you, uh, you might have to uh, sum over very many support vectors. And if you have overlapping classes, and if you allow for slack, and uh, if you're going from millions to billions of training examples, uh, this means that eventually every prediction will become quite slow. Uh, this is a little bit similar to the problem of k-nearest neighbors, yeah, where you need to uh, search over all your neighbors to make a decision. And so if, for instance, you could uh, map to, let's say, only a 40-dimensional space, you could represent your uh, weight vector explicitly as a vector with 40 entries rather than summing over, you know, thousands and thousands of support vectors. And it is hence uh, sometimes in the context of working with very large data sets attractive to perform this mapping to the higher dimensional space explicitly. One advantage I've mentioned now, the other advantage is that in this primal space there are also efficient learning algorithms. And now these approximations to a kernel they revolve around uh, this equation here. It's Bochner's theorem, but this is a paper by Rahimi and Recht. And uh, the theorem says that uh, any continuous kernel can be expressed like that. So for people working with time series, uh, this is essentially the same as your uh, covariance function and spectral density. Uh, so those are just uh, the basis functions of the Fourier transform, and this is um, your, uh, well, your, uh, your non-negative measure. And so this is essentially the Fourier transform of your kernel. And you could now evaluate uh, this integral exactly by truly integrating over all of this Fourier space. Now this is W, which is not the same as the uh, or sorry, this is omega, which is not the same as the w that I wrote uh, on the board. Um, and rather than computing this integral exactly, you can approximate it by sampling from this uh, distribution. And so this is what people sometimes do. They uh, really uh, compute for the exact kernel, what would be its uh, Fourier transform? And you know, for the Gauss kernel, this is just uh, Gaussian, and uh, for, for other kernels, so there's a small table. Uh, so for some uh, popular kernels, uh, their uh, transform. And you can then sample from these uh, densities and use then just these few samples to approximate this integral and uh, to hence obtain a finite dimensional approximation to your exact kernel. 
okay, this was in passing and as a postscript and we don't need that uh, in the official lecture. Okay, um, what I want to do, however, officially is the following, namely the one class support vector machine or support vector data description. Those are two related methods. So first, what's uh, the relevance? As title, uh, I want to use outlier detection in general with uh, maximum margin methods. Now we have so far discussed extensively how to separate two classes, but uh, sometimes you get corrupted input. And you know, if you have uh, uh, duly trained your classifier uh, given some training set and you now, uh, you know, if you now obtain a query here, yes, you should predict the class plus. And if you get uh, a measurement out here, um, you know, going by this classifier, I would still predict the class plus, but really it should, it should make you think, or at least as a, you know, as a human, it would make you think. But if you, you know, just plug this into your classifier, it will predict that this is class plus. Uh, this is what we call an outlier. You know, something that lies very far from the bulk of your data. And so if you, if you deliver a system to the real world, it better should have an outlier detection built in because otherwise, you know, you're just going to continue as usual and uh, all kinds of things might go wrong. Uh, there are other settings where, uh, uh, for instance, change detection, uh, where people are interested in uh, following a process and noticing when something drastic is changing. Uh, so you would have, uh, I'm now taking away these labels. Let's just say we have, uh, or you know, rather I'm blurring these labels. So let's just say we have points here and I just want to know if a, if a point, let's say this would be the uh, operation of the normal process, and I just want to know if, uh, if a query point falls within this regime of uh, uh, points that we've seen before, or if it looks very, very different. Now, uh, conventionally, you would solve this problem using density estimation, so you would, uh, you know, you could build a histogram in your feature space, or you could use kernel density estimation, which we'll also discuss towards the end of the semester. And so you could just, at each point in space, you could estimate the density of observations, and if this density falls below a threshold, uh, then you would raise an, al an alarm. So for instance, uh, you know, one possible solution would be to say, uh, I'm, I'm drawing some ISO contours. Now you could, for instance, fit this with a single Gaussian and say, uh, using this Gaussian model, if my density falls below some threshold, uh, I will flag this as an outlier. Or you can use something more flexible than a Gaussian, so you could uh, you know, compute isocontours that uh, reflect that we have uh, two subsets here, and uh, you could uh, raise an alarm whenever a new observation lies outside that subset. Now this will work and it will work fine provided you have picked the right uh, size for your uh, kernel and kernel density estimation. Uh, but we now want to look at a solution uh, in terms that is related to the support vector machine, namely one that has the potential to be sparser. And uh, the first method I want to introduce is called support vector data description. Or 
SVDD for short. Uh, this is a paper by Tux and Duin. Pretty old, so uh, might be 1999 or, or 2000, the first publication. And uh, the goal in SVDD is to find in this high dimensional space the mid.
and uh, Lagrange multipliers. And now we have our constraint. So we have This is for the first constraint, and then this is for the second. Okay, um, now we will minimize this beast with respect to Um, these primal variables. And uh, just like last time, we want to find something that is minimum with respect to R, C, and like variables and uh, should be a maximum with respect to these dual variables alpha and mu. So that's why we set the derivative to zero and we get a first useful condition out, namely that the sum over all the Lagrange multipliers should be one. We then differentiate with respect to C. And Dimensions here don't look right yet. Uh, let's see, should go. Um, and that's it, I think. So we found above that this sum here should be one. And we get a second condition by setting this to zero. We get the condition that uh, C should be so the center of my hypersphere will be a linear a convex combination of uh, some high dimensional versions of my training vectors xi. Okay. And we differentiate with respect to xi.
was a mistake down here, namely I had forgotten a xi i here to account for the second constraint. Uh, and that gives us an extra minus mu i here so that we again request this be zero at the saddle point. So one over mu n is alpha i plus mu i. Okay, so we can insert these into the Lagrangian to obtain our Wolfer dual. insert the optimum R and the optimum C and the optimum select variables. And find this R squared. So the first term here is uh, the inner product of phi of xi with itself, which I now write as the kernel here. Uh, minus twice And for C, I use this expression here. So this will give our second kernel. So if you look at this, this is uh, going to be minus twice C transpose C, and here I have plus C transpose C. So let's see what cancels. Uh, we have um, some i alpha i is just one. So if minus r squared plus r squared. So these go. And then uh, nu n itself was alpha i plus mu i. So this one cancels with these two and we're left with okay this was minus twice c transpose c plus c transpose c so and this was just one, so we have overall minus 
and I'm writing out the C transpose C. And I think that's it. Now let's look at the conditions that we need to fulfill if we now want to maximize this. So we requested from the start that uh, the alpha i should be positive and uh, by writing this Lagrangian we also requested that the mu i be positive and combining these two facts will tell us that alpha i should be less than 1 over mu n and the mu i should be non-negative. Um, this, sorry, this condition was already absorbed in what I just wrote here. Um, and anyway, this no longer depends on mu, but just on alpha. But then I need to take this constraint into account. Okay, so here we are, we have our final maximization problem and by inverting the signs here, I can write this as a minimization problem or, and it, it will then have the standard form of a quadratic programming problem. So we can uh, plug this into our solver and then obtain the following decision function. For our decision function, we, we want to know if the point is inside or outside the hypersphere. So I want to know if any point if a point fulfills this condition. And I can obtain the answer by plugging this into a sine function. So Now I can multiply this out again and I obtain uh, on the one hand kernel function of x with itself. where in multiplying out this uh, squared expression here, I have again used the description of, th of C that we had found before. So the expansion of C in terms of uh, the support vectors. Uh, however, we have not uh, set R yet. So we will choose the parameter R such that uh, the signum function is uh, zero only for points that lie outside the hypersphere. So we choose R as large as possible 
such that the signum function is zero only for points x i with a Lagrange multiplier that's larger than zero. So if, if we look at this sketch again, uh, the, the support vectors are the support vectors are those points that lie exactly on, on the boundary of the decision sphere or uh, the points lying outside. And we now, we have found C, and now we take the largest possible R such that uh, we, well, such that we, we get the signum function zero, so such that only the points that are support vectors uh, are deemed to lie outside of this ball. Okay, so we've we found in this high dimensional space uh, the center of this hyperball and we have found its radius. And I'll show you some pictures from a related paper. This is uh, This is the Schulkopf and colleagues version of the same problem. And you see two toy data sets, one without outliers. And for a given choice of, uh, of nu, uh, and for a given choice of the uh, width of the RBF kernel, this would be the decision boundary that's found. And whether it appears circular or not, that really depends on the kernel you choose. So if you use a, a kernel with a small width, uh, this decision boundary will really reflect all the minor uh, variations in your data set. Okay, so now we have a toy data set with some outliers here. And if we admit a lot of slack, then uh, they would be considered outliers if we admit very little slack, then they would be considered as inliers. And if at the same time uh, we reduce the, uh, the width of the RBF kernel, then we start to get here a much more complicated uh, decision surface. So this corresponds to density estimation with a more compact kernel. Now, the, what's the relation between this picture that I've shown and the method uh, we've described here? Uh, they are the same only for translation invariant kernels. So, what was written here now was the problem that is solved for the support vector data description. And if we now assume translation invariant kernels, the problem that we solve is uh, a simplified And this other term uh, that we had beforehand, so subject to the same constraint that we saw before,
and before we had an additional term, namely um, that minus for translation invariant kernel, uh, this thing here is a constant. <coughs> and hence can be omitted from the problem. Now, if the kernel is translation invariant, this amounts to the following picture. So this is now the high dimensional space. And in this high dimensional space, if the, if the kernel evaluated at each observation with itself has the same value, this means that uh, all the xi must lie on a ball in the first authent of uh, the coordinate system. So these would now be the xi in the training set. And the method that we've discussed so far will find the smallest circumscribing hypersphere Let's say, if I admit for some slack, this would be the hypersphere. And then we would have some slack for those outlying observations. So this hypersphere uh, cuts off from this big ball a segment in which the training data lies. And an alternative uh, view of the same problem is to simply try and separate all points from the origin, again allowing for some slack. So we would have some slack here and some slack there. And the second description, this is the one that is used by the one class support vector machine. So for the one class SVM, it is the origin, the origin of this high dimensional space. represents all outliers. And the reason is that if I take the inner product of uh, any observation with the origin itself, I get zero. So in a sense, what this reflects is that uh, this is The origin uh, lies far away from, or we could say it is dissimilar to to all training set observations. And that's why it's one possibility to just cut off the origin or separate the origin from, uh, uh, from all observations where the distance to the origin or the margin from the origin should be as large as zero 
allowing again for some slack. And you can in fact, uh, you know, write down the optimization problem in this fashion and you will end up with the same optimization problem that I've just mentioned here. So why is it called uh, one class learning? Because in these cases, we just uh, compare in liars and outliers. Uh, this is you know, also why I deleted the class labels here. Uh, originally, I had labels. This was the class circle, and the other was the class cross. But in one class learning, I just care about uh, things that I've seen before. Those are the in liars or unexpected uh, results. Th those are the outliers. So I am learning my one class of inliers against everything else, against all future contingencies, uh, against all possible outliers. This is why it's called one class learning. And I'll show you a few examples of uh, where we have used this. So we get uh, very large data sets from biologists containing uh, millions of images. And sometimes uh, something goes wrong in such an experiment. So there could be you know, an out of focus, a measurement could be out of focus, or there could be a speck of dust or, or human hair or something. And uh, before coming to the actual task, so before deciding, for instance, how many dividing cells, how many happy cells are in there, we want to find uh, such possible outliers. And uh, the way we have done this, and this is by uh, work by Christian Scheelen, who wrote his master's thesis here, um, we compute uh, different kinds of features. These features are collected in patches to aggregate information from a local neighborhood. And then we need a couple of images that are considered to be examples of the good class, to be example of inliers. And uh, we can compute you know, these patch statistics for all of these inlying patches, can then train a one class SVM, and then make uh, predictions on unseen images. So here's an example of what kinds of features uh, one could use, you can think of others, but you know they somehow encode uh, information from a local neighborhood. And here you see such an image with uh, some strange uh, artifacts that uh, shouldn't be there. Those images, as I said, are aggregated to get statistics uh, for patches. And uh, you can then indeed find, if you now present it with new images, so these things are marked with a red uh, block mean that uh, these image patches somehow look different from the inlying image patches that had been presented before. Okay, and that is important because if you, if you didn't do that, let's say you, you want to know what's the average fluorescence level of those cells in the images, and if you don't do any outlier detection, well, you will find that uh, this was a happy cell colony, you know, expressing huge amounts of a, of a given protein. And uh, in fact, you know, it was really something that went wrong or very wrong with uh, either the biology or, or the measurement. That is why it's important to check against uh, samples that look very different from what you would expect to see. Do you have questions? Yeah. Um, 
your remark is correct, and it, it holds also for you know the normal support vector machine. Um, the reason this one is being used is because it makes uh, the inference, you know, because it makes the calculations uh, tractable. If you use uh, squared, so where are we? Um, so if I if I did put a square here. I would end up with uh, you know something that wouldn't look as uh, as simple uh, as we get. That's basically the performance plus security threshold. Um, it is a it is a design decision. So in support vector machines, um, if we use this uh, linear function we have something which is called the hinge loss. And you can compare this to, so if, if we use a soft margin SVM with uh, this particular formulation of the cost here, then this is the error function that we optimize. Uh, you can compare this, for instance, to the zero one loss that is used by um, the perceptron, or you can compare this to uh, if you have a uh, hard margin SVM, you know, this would go to infinity. So infinity on the left side and zero on the right hand side. Um, we have more loss functions. Um, for instance, if you do boosting, it can be shown that uh, I should have drawn it like this. If you do boosting, one can show that this uh, corresponds to an exponential loss. So something that will look like that. Um, and then uh, logistic loss functions have been defined, uh, or logistic a logit boost has been defined, which is uh, which grows more slowly towards the left hand side. And now you're proposing to use not, you know, a linear, but a squared uh, penalty for the loss functions. So um, I think the result that you would get out uh, would make sense. So you would penalize outliers more, meaning outliers would have greater influence also on your, uh, on your result. You know, this would be justifiable but you would be a little more sensitive. So, you know, if, if a point lies here, if we give linear or quadratic loss, if we give quadratic loss, it will pull the, you know, the ball much more it's towards itself. So, so it will make it less sensitive to, or sorry, if you use the square, it would be more sensitive to outliers and it would be computationally harder. Oh. Even if it's here, that point I would have to shift this uh, square because uh, the way it's written now means that the radius grows the same amount of slack means a lower amount of distance in the Euclidean space that's actually covered by the square. So you would like a square here. So we can look at the consequences, what happens if we do that. So we would get uh, the square in here. And then yeah, you see it would we had this nice uh, cancellation here of the two terms of these two terms with that one. If we put in, uh, if 
we put in the square, this will no longer work. So you know you can you can do the math, but I think it's just that uh, the resulting problem will be harder if you put in the square at that point. So uh, you know you can. Uh, there are other things. Why do you minimize uh, the square and not just you know the absolute value of of the radius? Uh, or in SVMs, in SVMs we looked at the minimization problem, where we had uh, something with W transpose W. You can also use just the absolute norm of W that will give you an L1 SVM, uh, but all of those make optimization harder. So there is some, uh, there are some decisions in this formulation that have been made just so as to make the optimization task as simple as possible. So there's some arbitrariness in the, in the formulation, uh, which however, you know, gives you these, uh, gives you these uh, nice properties for optimization. And uh, depending on uh, what you change, um, you can even lose convexity for example. Yeah. And that's the nice thing about SVMs, uh, or one of the nice things that you, that you have convexity. So you would say when you write down the optimization problem, you just end up with a problem, <laughs> or is it they try everything in the no. calculation? I, I, I don't, I think you, uh, you know, at least I don't see it when looking at this formula. I think you really have to uh, go through the math. So I will, uh, I have one more problem. You know, it looks innocent, but, uh, but you lose convexity. So because we're having this discussion now, let's do this immediately. And then finally there's your well-earned break. Well, but the table will be full anyway, so let's have this. Let's have this break now, Anna. Huh? Seven, minutes Seven minutes to go. Yeah. And how are you doing? <laughs> okay. <laughs> how long your batteries last? Okay. So uh, we've looked. So you now know two class learning. You know one class learning. Uh, we can now look at. Uh, uh, two and a little, or a little bit less than two class learning. <laughs> so anyway, uh, it's called semi-supervised learning. The idea in semi-supervised learning is that you use both your labeled and unlabeled data to arrive at a conclusion. And in this case, we want to look at semi-supervised learning with the transductive SVM. Or TSVM for short. So idea is the following. You have let's say you you have uh, one labeled point and two unlabeled points, I have class plus and class minus. And if I only consider the labeled points, let's say by one class SVM, I would draw my decision boundary here. As a human, you would perhaps argue that uh, you know, there's a larger gap here. Let me draw some additional points to make this gap clearer. You would perhaps argue that no, really the decision boundary Should be there. That's by hypothesizing that these points which are close together will probably belong to the same class. And this uh, hypothesis is also called the cluster assumption. Cluster assumption 
is a qualitative term. So people have given different numerical definitions uh, for this property. So uh, Vapnik has proposed uh, in the end of the last millennium the following problem. Given n labeled and m unlabeled points, and by the way, this whole rationale of semi-supervised learning is that very often m can be very much larger than n. So uh, the labels come from human experts, and human experts, you know, they need to get paid, and they're getting tired and bored and so on. So, you know, you might have uh, 100 labeled examples, <coughs> but uh, millions of unlabeled ones. And in image processing, that's a typical example. You have uh, zillions of images on Flickr, uh, which might be no tagged or only have very poor tags. And then you have uh, perhaps a few thousand images where humans have painstakingly labeled what is what, okay? And uh, it seems, uh, intuitively, it seems like a pity to not use these unlabeled points at all. And this is uh, the reason for using semi-supervised learning. Now, uh, Vapnik has proposed the following formulation. So the given n labeled and m unlabeled points to solve the following. So this is just the normal SVM that we know for labeled data. You see the, those slack variables, they are indexed from 1 to n, so only for the labeled points. And then in addition, there's a separate s set of slack variables for the unlabeled points. Conditions being again, those are the conditions for the normal SVM, and then there is an additional set of conditions, namely that the unlabeled points should lie further then some limit from the margin. No matter on what side, they should just lie far from the margin. Now, this first assumption, so maximizing the margin between the labeled points, that gives you regularization. And the second assumption that embodies the cluster assumption. So if you use on this particular data, this formulation here, it would give you the blue solution and not, uh, sorry, the red solution, not the blue one, because uh, you know, here we would have a very small margin of the unlabeled points, and here we have a large margin even for the unlabeled points for the red solution. So it looks innocent enough, I would say, but uh, because you have uh, these, this absolute value here, uh, this problem is no longer convex. And the numerics have turned out to be extremely involved. So there have been a score of papers saying that uh, this is just a bad objective function because we used it and we got bad results. And then there have been other papers saying, yeah, you just didn't get the numerics right and how you tweak your parameters and you know, you should have done like us. Um, so, uh, I think there are more popular and perhaps also more plausible methods 
for semi-supervised learning, but this is the one that is closest related to the normal SVM. And this is an, a case in point where a small change in, uh, in this case, the constraints makes the problem go from tractable to practically intractable. Any more questions? <coughs>